Well, good morning, and it's good to see you all here this morning in the house of the Lord. This week, God answered prayer again. Mary and I were in Auckland, and uh, she had three doctors to see in two days. Three doctors in two days. And the specialist that we first saw after waiting four hours confirmed that he will now operate on her labral tear in her hip. So that's one pain eradicated. Amen. The other one said, yep, I'm willing to do the back too. He says, I'll give you a cortisone injection so we can lo locate exactly where that pain's coming from. So again, the Lord has answered prayer because prior to this, there was just nothing happening. Then on Tuesday, after we received greetings from Bev Sumner, who she passes on to you all, and Naira Smith, she also passes on her greetings to you all here in Wongarei. And she's even prepared a little, little wee um, sweetie for the children, which Mar Marianne will pass out after the service. So... Uh, don't rush and push my wife over after the service, young people. So on the Tuesday, again, we were able to glorify God because Mary Ann was cleared of her cancer that she had in her arm. So our, lo our Lord is big and he answers prayer. Amen. So it was a good, it was a good day for, for us this week. We also had the opportunity, and I must say we spent quite a bit of time in prayer, or I'm, especially I did, in regards to the next visit. Our next visit was to the conference office, and we went and had a, had a meeting with Pastor Tupai, our president. And after just talking about the way things are going, and because it was our prayer for Mary and I that the Lord put us where we can serve him the most, well, the president said, OK, you're staying here for another year as assistant to Adrian, so um, you're going to put up with us for another year, folks. So, um, but as we reflect back to on this year, especially before a communion service, we realise that as we lead out, we're not perfect, we make mistakes. And of course, you know that we have offended you either in words or in something that we've written or something that we said. So we apologise before you, before God this morning, to ask you to forgive us because we're only trying to, to lead the church and represent God here on earth. This morning, we come to celebrate a communion service in memory of the greatest sacrifice in earth's history. We are only seven days, however, away from the day that the world uses to celebrate our Lord's birth. At least some of them who are apart from the commercial who, apart from the commercialism that it has become Christmas. Jesus' humble birth in Bethlehem. But what good? What good would that birth have been if Jesus was only born and didn't pay that price? that he'd come to pay. Yes, his death. And what good would it have been if he did not rise again from the dead in that beautiful resurrection morning? These two great historic events go hand in hand. But I'd like to start our story this morning with another story that's uh, pertaining to what I wanted to say this morning. And it's about a salesman. A salesman is passing through the upper regions of Lebanon. We all know it's hot, he was thirsty, and he was tired. As the sun beats down on this small northern village, everything looks the same as it always does as the sun bathes all the houses, shops, and businesses in a dusty yellow. He has one but more appointment before he can retire for the day and relax in a cool hotel room. As he gets out of the cab, he uh, confirms the address of his appointment. He makes his way to the entrance, and out of the corner of his eye amongst the throng of people, he happens to notice a woman, elegant, ele elegantly but brisk, walking past the corner of the building, presumably heading up the street. He then walks into the business of his appointment and exchanges small talk with the owner. And as is the custom, he is asked what type of refreshment would he like. He settles for a red tea, and as the owner calls for his request, it does not take long before the same woman appears um, that he spotted outside. She enters the room carrying a tablet with two red teas. As she crosses the room, again he is impressed by her conduct and how elegantly she carries herself 
and her posture. There's something about this lady that is intriguing. It intrigues him so much, and yet she is a woman of no natural beauty. She's no pageant model. She's no Hollywood star. However, there was something about her that he could not quite put his finger on it. As he sipped his tea and spoke to the owner over the proposal that he was presenting, for some reason he just suddenly blurts out and says, look, look I'm sorry, I'll, I'll have to stop here, but who is that woman? The owner grins and says, that is my wife. What intrigues you about her? A little bit embarrassed now, he stutters, there's something actually beautiful about your wife that fascinates me, but for the life of me, I cannot put my finger on it. The owner has such a proud smile on his face, and he exclaims that it's okay. You're not the first one to ask this question. However, um, uh, my wife, he says, was originally from a very poor family, and she was their only daughter. Because she is not such a natural beauty as others are, nobody was really interested in her. However, I then came along and introduced myself to her family, and straight away I offered her father ten cows dowry for their daughter. Her poor father nearly fell off his chair. No man had ever offered one or two cows, let alone ten. Gratefully, her father accepted my offer. As soon as Sabrina, his daughter, heard that I had offered him ten cows, for her, her whole demeanour changed and her deportment changed. No one had ever offered as half as much for any of the other young ladies in the village whom had been married off prior to her. Sabrina was now worth ten cows. In her world, that was a huge dowry. That was the change in her life. Her worth had exceeded everything that she could have imagined, and because of her husband's generosity, she has made him proud in every aspect of their life together. Luke 12, 7, Indeed, the hairs of your head are all numbered, don't be afraid, you are worth more than many sparrows. Our worth in contrast to Sabrina's, but also as well as Sabrina, is huge. Because of what life throws at us and the circumstances of our lives that are created, we sometimes think that we are not as good as the next person or the manager of the local supermarket or the owner of the house that I rent my workmates' parents, for an example, or the school teacher. Poverty does not debate our worth. Dictate, sorry. Poverty does not dictate our worth, and nor does the stacks of money that are stored in the bank that it belongs to our accounts. The clothes we wear also are no indication of our worth, or even the vehicles that we drive or the homes that we live in. No, we cannot measure our worth by material things or the success, success and education of others. No, we are worth so much more. So very, very, very much more. If we were you, even if you were born into another culture, with another skin colour, or speak another language, whether you are young or old, you were, are worth so much more and you all know why. You were bought with a price, and it was not ten cows or ten bulls. It was paid by a lamb. 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, Do you not know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honour God with your bodies. A price tag was placed on every one of you, and that price has been paid. No lay-by, no hire purchase, no credit of 36 months, or mortgage, nothing. Next to every name here this morning is a receipt. 
It's a done deal. And it simply reads this morning, Gary Holman, child of God, penalty paid in full, signed Jesus Christ. Jesus, the Son of God, left his majestic home of glory, of praise, to become just like us, flesh and blood, tempted in all manner as we are, to pay the ultimate wage for all sin, death. A wage, actually, that you and I should personally pay. After all, we're the ones that have transgressed. We are the ones that have committed the sin. But no, he did it all for you and I. Acts chapter 20, verse 28 says, Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. The Son of God... A dearly beloved son paid that price, death on a cross for you and me. Blood that was shed from the Garden of Gethsemane all the way to Calvary for you and me. The lamb that was slain before the foundations of the world. A price that we can never repay. So then, what is your worth? Ten cows, many sparrows, how much? It costs the life of a king, the life of our creator, the life of the son of God. It costs God his son. As sons and daughters of God, how do we then conduct ourselves? Do we thankfully represent our Lord and reflect his image in us? Do we present ourselves as ones whom are saved? Is your light shining? Is your light on? Or do we go around like little church mice, humbly bent over with hands wrought, hoping that we're saved, maybe saved, perhaps we're saved? Hopefully not. The highest price ever has been paid. You are saved today. Today is the day of your salvation. So even if you were the only recipient of this free gift, it would still have been paid. Because you are so much more worth in the eyes of God, remember to live worthy of such a gift, just as you are come and take hold of this wonderful gift. I'd just like to ask Leanne to come forward now. cold this night as Jesus standing speaking to his disciples and to trying to wipe away the stains of blood from his brow that he had formed as he agonized in prayer to his father for strength for he knew his hour had come just as he finished his sentence he heard the soldiers approaching with their swords and clubs clanging as they walked Judas leading comes close kisses him on the cheek and immediately he is seized by the soldiers. Before he is led away, he touches the air of Melchius and heals it. He is then taken to the house of Caiaphas, the high priest. As Jesus heard the cock crow the third time, he looked at Peter. In the crowd to see him hang his head in shame and move away. The guards mocked him, blindfolded him and smote him on the face and blasphemed him. As the day broke, the priest the, and the elders of the church came together. As the council met, false accusations were thrown upon him, were thrown upon Jesus. But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God, tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus replied, you have said so. But I say to all of you, from now on you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Blasphemy, we have heard it ourselves from his own mouth. Do we need to hear any more? He is then taken to Pilate and accused of being Christ a king. Not 
disturbed by their accusations, Pilate asked, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said, says Jesus. After much conversation with the Jewish council, Pilate washes his hands of the matter and releases Barabbas and sentences Jesus to their, to their demands of death by crucifixion. The soldiers, the soldiers then flogged Jesus and pushed a crown of thorns into his head, clothed him in a scarlet robe, gave him a rod as a scepter and mocked him again, continually beating his crown with his scepter. They reclothed Jesus and led him out to be crucified. Weak and in pain, unable to carry the cross of timber, Simon from Cyrene is forced to carry it for him all the way to Golgotha. The cross is dropped from Simon's shoulder to the ground and Jesus is forced upon it. Stripped of his clothing, his skin is torn and bleeding. The wood is hard and rough. Suddenly, they pull his arms apart and thrust huge nails through his healing hands. His body is pulled and nails entered through his feet. Breathing heavily, trying to ease the pain, the cross is violently hoisted and dropped into a well-dug hole, pulling on the nails as it hit the bottom. The jeering slowly abates as darkness covers the land. People wait to hear any last word from the Saviour. A small dialogue takes place between the thieves on his left and right. He instructs John to look after his mother. About three in the, three in the afternoon, noon, sorry, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? His head then falls to one side as he breathes his last. The price had just been paid for you and for me. You know, that sacrifice that Jesus did, that price that he paid was for the healing of the world, that we too can have healing in our bodies, forgiveness of sins. So we know this morning that there are people who are also regarding, re requiring healing, and I'd just like them now to come forward and so that we can have a prayer with them, because uh, it's a special moment in our, in our worship service this morning. So I'd like those who are who are suffering, who need prayer this morning, just come down and I'll pray with you this morning. If any of the elders would like to come and pray with me, you're welcome to come down. It's a special time. It's a special time in a communion service that we find ourselves worthy to come before our Lord. Just come closer, just come closer. If there's anybody else, be, feel free to come. Thank you, elders. Yeah, it's good to see you, it's good to see you. Let's all just kneel, come in the group here, and we'll just kneel and hold hands. You all right? Dearest Heavenly Father, as we come before you on this holy Sabbath day, a high Sabbath, Lord, because we're celebrating that wonderful sacrifice that you did for each and every one of us, Lord. Heavenly Father, as we kneel before you, there's been names given to us this morning that people who, who you love and who you died for that are, that are in need of your healing hands, Lord, in need of your help. We think of Jamie Schrock this morning, our dear brother in the Philippines, Lord, who's, who's depressed who's sick, he's not well, Lord, we pray that you'll touch him this morning with your spirit to let him know that uh, we love him and we want him to come home. Father, we'd like to pray too that you're with uh, Annette and Dennis, Lord. We ask that a special um, touch of healing will come upon those two, that you'll grant Dennis uh, employment, and we thank you for this too, Lord. Heavenly Father, we'd like to bring Eleanor and Ben before you this morning. You know her health problems, Lord. And we're just so thankful, Lord, that you can touch her and heal her. Thank you, Lord, that you're with Fen, that you give him the strength to support his wife and to let him know that you are so close uh, by their side. Father, we thank you for these other members, our other brothers and sisters that have come 
to kneel before you on this holy Sabbath day, Lord. We just pray, Lord, and give you thanks for Cecil and Nelson that they're here this morning. We thank you, Lord, for Carmen. You know the, the struggles that she's going through, Lord. We just pray that you'll touch her. Father David and Jocelyn are having troubles with their own health, Lord, and you're the only one that given, can give them the strength on a daily basis. You know us all, Lord, and we just pray that your healing hand will be upon us. We thank you, Lord, and we ask you, Lord, to forgive us because, Lord, we're not faithful. We've sinned and transgressed your law, but, Lord, we thank you that we have forgiveness in Jesus' holy name. Be with us now. Be with this total congregation. Be with those members who have decided not to come today, but touch their hearts too, Lord, to let them know that today you love them and that you're coming soon. Father, we pray that every one of us will be ready for that great day. In Jesus' loving name, amen. God bless you all. If you felt that you were left out of that prayer, you weren't. God knows what you need. I'd like us just to turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 13, and reading from verse 5. Verse, verse 4, sorry. He rises from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, and to, sorry, he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter said unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said, to, said unto him, What I do now thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter said unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said unto him, He that is washed need not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And ye are clean, but not all. For ye knew who should betray him, therefore said he, You are not all clean. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, Know you what I have done to you? Sorry, I just lost my place. Uh, so after he had washed their feet and taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, Know you what I have done to you? You call me Master and Lord, and you say, Well, and so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to, to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that has sent him. It's time now come, time's now come for us to go to our foot washing ceremony. And I'd like you to go with reverence, because this is still part of our communion service. With the men, I'd like you to, as you take your partner, to first pray with your partner before you wash their feet. God bless. Thank you.